Workers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant have found a new leak of radioactive water. The problem was discovered on Saturday at a barrier that surrounds wastewater storage tanks. Workers reported finding a puddle of contaminated water roughly one square meter in size beyond a barrier near the number four reactor. They tried to contain the leak with sandbags. Plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company detected 140 backrolls per liter of radioactive strontium. The utility says the leak occurred near a valve used to drain water from inside the barrier, but the valve was closed. TEPCO officials say no contaminated water reached the ocean. Engineers at the plant say some joints in the barrier may be responsible for the leak. The barrier is made up of concrete blocks bound by metal that is either bolted or welded. Officials from the Japanese government and Tokyo Electric Power Company have been discussing ways to weatherproof the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Storms and typhoons have battered the plant in recent weeks. They're hoping to limit leaks of radioactive water. Senior Vice Industry Minister Kazuyoshi Akaba said the extreme weather caused rainwater to leak from the plant. Akaba and other officials discussed the problem with TEPCO executives in Fukushima. They decided to attach drain pipes to the tops of tanks that store contaminated water by the end of March 2014. They estimate this would divert about 60 percent of rainwater. They agreed to double the height of all the barriers around the tanks to 60 centimeters by the end of this year and raise some parts to 1.3 meters by the end of March 2014 if necessary. And they'll repaint barriers that have been contaminated with radiation. Scientists with the International Atomic Energy Agency are checking how staff at Japan's crippled nuclear plant monitor radiation in the ocean. They watched workers take water samples off the Fukushima Daiichi site and say the method meets global standards. Two IAEA scientists watch workers collect seawater samples within 20 kilometers of the plant. People around the world are concerned the site may be contaminating the ocean because of repeated leaks of radioactive water. The IAEA is working with Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority to boost international trust in the sampling and analysis. In ensuring that the sea area monitoring plan uh, reflects good practice by the best international standards, and that means being a uh, comprehensive, credible, um, and uh, transparent. The scientists next plan to watch how workers analyze the samples. An expert panel is urging Japan's government to change how it measures radiation exposure of evacuees from near the troubled Fukushima Daiichi plant. The group of the Nuclear Regulation Authority on Monday endorsed draft proposals covering state support for people who want to return to their homes near the facility. The experts called on authorities to allow evacuees to return only after yearly radiation levels in their communities have fallen below 20 millisieverts. They also suggested a long-term goal of bringing annual exposure levels to one millisievert or less. Officials have so far based exposure estimates on radiation levels in the environment, but the panel says they should instead equip people with dosimeters. Readings on such devices tend to be one-third to one-seventh lower than estimates based on environmental monitoring. Fukushima evacuees had mixed reactions to the idea. I think it would be good to monitor radiation levels ourselves. Individual monitor readings don't necessarily reflect different radiation levels in a household. Leaving evaluation to the people is a neglect of responsibility by the government. The Nuclear Regulation Authority plans to compile the proposals and submit them to the government. Japanese delegates are trying to convince their South Korean counterparts to drop a strict trade embargo. They want them to lift a ban on imports of Japanese seafood, introduced after reports about leaks from the Fukushima nuclear plant. But their requests are failing to have an impact. Japan's Deputy Foreign Minister Yasumasa Nagamine discussed the embargo with his counterpart, on Chonggi in Tokyo. It applies to seafood from Fukushima and seven other Japanese prefectures. Nagamine said the ban is not supported by scientific evidence. 
Chong-gi reportedly told Nagamine South Korea is satisfied with its handling of the matter. Officials in Seoul issued the embargo in September. They were responding to reports that contaminated water leaked from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant into the ocean. Some of Japan's leading beverage makers are showing their support for farmers in Fukushima. They are selling drinks made from produce from the prefecture. Farmers have suffered since the nuclear accident two years ago over concerns about food safety. The people at Kagome stopped using tomatoes from Fukushima soon after the accident. But now they'll sell juice made exclusively from tomatoes harvested there. They installed equipment to monitor radioactivity levels in food. They say they're reintroducing the produce after two years of checks confirmed that it's safe. Marketers with Kirin Brewery are promoting an alcoholic drink containing juice from pears harvested in Fukushima. Fukushima we want to help enhance the brand image of produce from Fukushima by using local pears. The drink will be a limited edition on sale only until the end of the year, but managers say that could change if the beverage proves popular. Japanese government and ruling Liberal Democratic Party officials are considering a substantial reduction of a key subsidy for rice farmers. The officials are hammering out the details of a five-year plan to abolish the so-called rice production adjustment system. Rice farmers currently receive a subsidy for capping production. Each participating farmer receives about $150 per 1,000 square meters of rice producing land. But leaders are planning to cut that to about $50 starting fiscal 2014. The subsidy program will be abolished at the end of fiscal 2018. Officials are hoping to make the agricultural sector more competitive. They are to make a final decision on this this month. I kept a watchful eye on impossibly feathered birds. My nostrils flared, inhaling the exotic perfume of pomegranates and lilies. What world is this? The realm of poetry's fine mist, the entrance to the garden of the heart, which is open to those who have first endured the whims and taunts of the moon, and then been rewarded by her sympathies. How did I arrive within the walls of this labyrinth of roses? When long, I believed that I was the courtier with keys, who, approaching the girdle of time, found the keys did not fit. Is it Grace who spilled a drop of precious wine upon my brow and caused my eyes to open wide to love's glory? Or am I simply some fortunate wanderer who, pitied by providence, is taken in as one would open the door of a warm home place to a sweet and gentle orphan child who begs with plaintive plea relief from the winter's wrath outside. outside.
Fukushima Prefecture is set to explore new sources of power. A test run of what will be one of Japan's largest wind farms has begun off the coast there. The industry ministry has set up a floating wind turbine 20 kilometers off Naraha town. A ceremony was held on Monday to mark the test run. The Japanese government wishes to make Fukushima a pioneer in renewable energy. The prefecture was hurt by the nuclear accident. So this is our mission. The turbine can generate enough power for 2,000 homes. A steady supply of strong winds gives offshore installments greater efficiency than wind farms on land. Next fiscal year, the central government will add two more turbines at the site. Each of the new rotors will have three times the generating capacity of the current one. The government will use the turbines to assess the possible impact on the local fishing industry. Delegates from nearly 200 nations have gathered in Warsaw, Poland to hammer out the details of a new framework on climate change. But those from developing and industrialized nations are at odds over who should foot the bill. The delegates are debating the terms of a plan that would come into effect in 2020. A representative from the European Union called on them to go further than ever in their pledges. He said the window of opportunity is closing. Climate change is happening. Humans are the cause of this change, and we do need to act urgently to avoid the worst impacts. China's delegates said industrialized countries should offer more financial and technological support to developing nations. We need to ensure a structure that recognizes that historical responsibility and where developed countries take the lead to address climate change. Japanese delegates will propose cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 3.8 percent from 2005 levels by 2020. That's less ambitious than a proposal submitted four years ago. Japanese leaders say they've had to adjust because of a greater reliance on thermal energy since the nuclear accident in Fukushima. Yukari Takamura, an expert on environmental policy, says Japan should aim for a higher greenhouse gas reduction target. Japan's new reduced target is below that of other advanced nations that are trying harder and is likely to come under international criticism. Takamura also says the new target may lead to Japan becoming less influential at the talks. People in Japan appear to be growing more concerned about their financial well-being after retirement. Officials at the Bank of Japan released the results of an annual survey on household finances. 65% of respondents said their main concern is putting aside money for retirement. The answer topped the list for the first time since the survey began in 1953. Saving for illness or disaster was the number one answer up until last year. This time, it was a close second at 63%. And the third most common concern was saving for children's education at 30%. People may be worried about their pension and other post-retirement income due to Japan's low birth rate and the aging population. Swiss forensic experts have added to claims that late Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat was assassinated. They've detected a high level of radioactive polonium in his remains. Arafat got sick in 2004, then died. Many Palestinians have believed for years that he was poisoned. Last year, Palestinian authorities asked for a forensic investigation. The Al Jazeera News Network says the Swiss experts found levels of polonium in Arafat's body that were 18 times higher than normal. They concluded that their results moderately support the idea that he was poisoned. I felt that I'm mourning him uh, again. Uh, I was in a shock. Uh, I felt uh, the anger, you know, shock and anger and... Uh, huge sadness. She says she wants to know the truth about her husband's death. Palestinian authorities have yet to comment on the report.
Diplomats from Iran and six world powers have ended three days of talks in Geneva on Tehran's nuclear program. They've decided to meet again later this month to narrow their differences. EU foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton and Iran's foreign minister Mohammad Javad Zarif have opened a news conference after the talks. A lot of concrete progress has been achieved, but some differences remain. What I was looking for was the political will and determination and readiness and good faith. The negotiations were initially scheduled to end on Friday, but they were raised to the ministerial level and extended to Saturday. The participants tried to reach a deal to restrict Iran's uranium enrichment activities in exchange for the partial lifting of international sanctions. But opinions remain divided over, what ex over to what extent international sanctions should be lifted. Officials from Iran and the six world powers have agreed to meet again in Geneva on November 20th to try to reach an agreement. Japan's foreign minister is trying to encourage Iran's leaders to reach an agreement on the country's nuclear program. Negotiators from Iran and six world powers are trying to strike a deal to restrict its nuclear enrichment activities. Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida wants to take advantage of Japan's ties with Iran to try to move the process forward. NHK World's Chiaki Ishikawa has more. <laughs> Fumio Kishida met Foreign Minister Mohammad Jahad Zarif, who just returned from Geneva. The next round of talks on the Iranian nuclear issue is scheduled to start on November 20. The ministers issued a statement agreeing to cooperate on resolving Iran's nuclear development issue. I sincerely hope Iran will be flexible in the negotiations. If Japan can help reach an agreement in any way, then we would like to do so. Kishida also met President Hassan Rouhani on Saturday. The foreign minister pushed for a peaceful resolution through good relations with Iran. The countries have maintained political, economic, cultural and other exchanges for decades. During Japan's post-war recovery era, a direct oil deal with Iran bypassed the Western oil majors. The imports continued even after the United States severed diplomatic relations with Iran following the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Japan lacks natural resources and has relied on Iran for oil and gas. Most of Iran's exports go to China, India, and then Japan. Crude oil accounted for more than 98% of Iran's exports to Japan. And Iran is the fifth leading crude oil supplier to Japan, following Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, and Kuwait. Japan and Iran will mark 140 years in 2015 since both countries started exchanges. Japanese government officials say they will continue to make use of the ties to help resolve the current nuclear issue. Chiaki Ishikawa, NHK World. Negotiators from the International Atomic Energy Agency may have reached a breakthrough with Tehran on a long-time standoff. The two sides have agreed on a roadmap to resolve issues over Iran's nuclear program. IAEA Director General Yukiya Amano met in Tehran with the head of Iran's atomic energy organization, Ali Akbar Salehi. The International Atomic Energy Agency and Islamic Republic of Iran just issued a joint statement on a framework for cooperation. Salehi said Iran would allow IAEA inspectors to visit, with advance permission, a mine in southern Iran used for uranium enrichment. And leaders will allow inspections of a heavy water reactor in western Iran. Observers have raised concerns it could produce plutonium that can be used for weapons. Salehi said Iran is ready to be flexible. The two sides will implement the agreement over the next three months. It's believed that the new framework will not include inspectors' visits to a military facility in Parchin, near Tehran, where Iran is suspected of developing nuclear weapons. This is an important step forward to start with.
but much more needs to be done. Working-level negotiations got underway on Monday, centering on IAEA inspections of nuclear-related facilities in Iran. By completing this video, you have proven you are capable of filming, producing, and editing your own. We expect one video from you by the end of next week.